is what side of the road do you want to travel on? What side of the road do you want to hang on? You know how your friends call, you want to hang out? Yeah. My question is where you want to hang out. Where do you want your feet to abide? Where do you want to tiptoe? Where do you want to see to sit? So one of the things that will show you if you're hanging out on the dark side is if your friends, your buddies, your homies, whatever you want to call them, are doing everything that is diametrically opposed to what you know the Bible says. But because you want to have friends, and because you want to hang out, you end up settling and conforming. So you have to remember Romans that says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. A lot of sacrifices of walking with the Lord, but God rewards you so much that you don't miss what you're sacrificing. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, the least you could do. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So knowing that the word is admonishing us to become living sacrifices. And knowing that Isaiah 60 promises the brightness of God's shining on our lives, the, the sun rising, his light coming and the glory of God rising upon us. But then we see the covering of the, the cloak of the darkness, the the clouds moving in on the people that are not giving God the time of day, people who do not fear him, who do not revere him. Now, here's the problem with society. Let's start here. Do you remember when they took the Bibles and prayer and all that out of the schools? Yeah. Yeah. That was strategic too, but we won't go into that. We know that. Those of us who have an eye to see and an ear to hear, we kind of get that one. A lot of the rest of you are like in La La Land. You're like, huh? What you talking about? Well, years ago when we used to pray in class, I remember those times when we used to pray in class. And when we pray and the teacher would teach, there would always, there would always at times be scriptural principles being taught in the classroom based on our behavior when they were addressing how we behaved in class, addressing what true character was. When we sang in the little choruses in third, fourth, and fifth grade, half of the songs were Christian songs. Some of them were hymns. Let there be peace on earth. And let it begin with me. Then there was another one that said, uh, uh, oh, Lord, it, uh, you know, let us eat together. Let us pray together. These were songs that were sung in churches. We sang in school. Now, that made one's senses a lot more um, inclined to know the difference between right and wrong. But see, when you remove light from the, the, the stage, let's say, when you remove light from the surroundings and you allow darkness to cave in on, on top of everything and the power is out, picture yourself trying to maneuver through your house. Picture that. Picture trying to find your pocketbook, your wallet, Picture trying to find your glasses. Picture trying to find your shoes. Did you put them in this room? In that room, they blend right into the darkness. Now, here's the problem with that. When the darkness hits and everything starts to blend in with the darkness, blend in with the blackness, what happens is there is no definition left. There is no way of telling the difference between a chair and a table because you can't see the outline. You can't see the shadow of a highlight because there is no light. And when you don't have an outline 
everything looks the same. And that's what's happening in this day and age because there's so much darkness cloaking this world. Everything looks the same. So when you talk about things that are right or you talk about things that are wrong, in a lot of people's mind, there's no difference. How can you call that wrong? You're being judgmental. No, you're not being judgmental. The difference is you're walking in the light and you can see the difference. But the person who lives in the dark, who abides in the dark, who you who bases all their judgment, their, their values on what's happening in the dark, they don't even know what's right and they definitely don't know what's wrong because there's no light being shined there to make a, a, a definition, to make a distinction between the two. And that's what's happening now. So while some of you, and it's not a lot, unfortunately, while some of you have a heart towards God, you're yielded to him, you're mortifying the deeds of the flesh, you're walking with him, you're trying to walk in his footsteps like a little kid walks in their daddy's footsteps in the sand and, it's a, and, and they love it or they dance on daddy's toes. A lot of you are so given to the dark. You wouldn't know God if he walked up to you. Because you can't tell him apart from the devil. You can't tell an angel apart from a demon. See what I'm saying? Think about that. And when there's no distinction between right and wrong, you're living in a world where everything goes, anything goes. It's your fine. Do what you want to do. I can't tell you who to sock it to. Him and that. And you're socking it everywhere you can. And you're doing everything you're big and bad enough to do. And you're making allowances over here and stretching the envelope over there. And after a while, you're like, well, I can't judge them. And I can't tell them they're wrong. And, you know, everybody's an individual. No, not in the body of Christ. Because the body of Christ is not an organization. We were talking about that the other night in class. The body of Christ is an organism. And a lot of us have heard that coming up through church. It's a living organism. So is the human body. It's a living organism. And all of the white corpuscles and the blood cells and the, and the, and the red blood cells and the, the plasma and the fluids and the, the chemical structure and, the, and all of this works together. They work succinctly together for that organism to thrive and function correctly. But when you belong to an organism that doesn't function correctly because there are infections over here and there's cancer over there and there are broken parts over on the other section and your feet are loaded with fragmented bones and you can't even walk. You sure can't walk straight. So the organism is messed up, and that's what's happening to a lot of church memberships. The organism is messed up. Some of them are messed up starting from the head because they're getting false doctrine. Why do they get false doctrine? Because the leader of that church is living in darkness. Hmm. And they're delivering your food, the word, out of darkness. So now your values are getting mixed up. You don't know if it's right to be a man or a woman or an it or them or whatever. You don't know because it's too dark. You can't see. And that's what's happening in this world. But see, here's the problem with that. If you agree with the light that God wants in your life, then you benefit in so many ways. But if you agree with the darkness and you guide your affairs and you value things based on what the darkness is telling you, you're putting yourself in harm's way. It's like living a life, living a life without eyesight. You are literally blind in spirit. 
But I ask you right now, before we go any further, station identification, let's have a pause. Please ask God to give you your eyesight. Please ask God to give you an ear to hear. Ask God to give you eyes to see and a mind to understand what you're seeing, what you're looking at. So that you don't fall for the devil's okie doke. So you don't fall for the tricks of the darkness. So you don't hook up and yoke up with demons unknowingly. I'm going to share this because, yeah, I th I'm feeling it. And Lord, <laughs> stop me if I'm not supposed to. Okay, I'm feeling the peace. Here it goes. Come on, brace yourselves on this one because it's going to be a little crass. It's going to be a little sensitive for some of you. There are women who have given testimony on YouTube who have said, that they have secret lovers when they sleep. And these secret lovers, they know are demons. But by day, they walk with the Lord because they believe in Jesus Christ. But since they don't have anybody in their lives and they're not doing it with anybody, they feel like they can allow this interaction, this culmination with the demonic realm when they're sleeping because it feels so good. Now, what I want to ask you, do you really think, you really think you can literally sleep with the devil and have breakfast with the Lord? You really think the Lord is going to step aside and be your other lover? You really think he's going to go for that? See, that is the problem. There's so much new wave, so much crystal and, and incantations and potions and witchcraft and all kind of stuff that is crept into the body of Christ. And this is the reason. See, when you live by the light, when you keep all your lights on and it's bright, if you see a stain in your carpet, you're going to see it real quick. If you see a smudge on your wall, you're going to spot it real quick because you know, oh no, that wasn't there yesterday. Let me get rid of that. You know, that's not part of the design on your paint. You, you know, you don't have a uh, wallpaper with a print on it. That's dirt and you get rid of it, right? But this is the sad part. When you live in the darkness, you can't see all the smudges. You can't see all the stains. You can't see the filth. You can't see the dirt. Think about this now. And when you live amongst that all your life, you don't even see it. You don't notice it much when the person turns on the light. Okay? So when you're around a nasty environment full of cussing and fussing and lying and cheating and backstabbing and treachery and 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 uh, supplanting and, and and ripping folks off and I was I was doing my assignment the other night. Let me. Uh, there's a, a part where it talks about this cuckoo, and the cuckoo is a bird that takes his eggs and puts them in somebody and another bird's nest, and that's what a lot of treachery does. And we don't realize we live that kind of life. That's all we know because we've been living in the dark for so long. When the light comes on, it's too bright for us. It hurts our eyes because we've been in the dark forever. So when a person comes with holiness, when a person comes with words from the word, we don't want to hear that. That hurts my ears. That hurts my eyes. They're so irritating to be around. Why? The light. The darkness does not comprehend the light and light dispels the darkness. So if you abide by the darkness, the light can't come in and interfere with your darkness because you, you have to willfully go to that light. God's not going to drag you out to it. But for those who want to live in the light, for those who want to be there, those who love being in God's life, being wrapped up and tied up in his truth, knowing if there's something not right in my heart, oh, we're going to confess this and get rid of it right now. 
You love making improvements on your character. You love seeing yourself grow in the things of God, holiness, understanding more and more of the word. You love all that. You love God using you, God ministering to you, God warning you. You love that. But for the person who has fed off of darkness all their lives, the light is just over the top, baby. I'm sorry. But you just, you know, a little too super Christian for me. You know, you need to go on and go to heaven because you're so earthly, uh, so so heavenly minded. You sure ain't no earthly good. You ain't going to do me no good with all that preaching around me. Now, see, that's sad. But that's the mindset of people who love the darkness. Now, let's move on. Go with me to Isaiah 44. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm doing this in the same order I got it. Okay, go with me to Isaiah 44. Okay, now in Isaiah 44, I'm going to start at verse 1. Yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jezurim, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon thy dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the willow courses, one shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, another subscribed by the hand of the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am first, and I am last, and beside me there is no other. I'm going to shoot to verse 8. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Then he goes on to describe people and make graven images and worship all kind of idols, you know. And we can go into that. That take up two weeks to describe all these idols that are in the world today. But what I want to share with you is God promises to be a very present help in time of need. He promises to lead, to guide, to open your eyes, to help you, to bless you, to supply, to support, to even bless your offspring. He is in the blessing business. But here's the thing. God's not a bully. He's not going to make you you know how some of you hook up with these little sorry Charlies that talk about, oh, you going to love me. I'm going to make you love me. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not even God's way. That is what the devil uses people to do. He creates bullies out of people who are living in the dark. It's easy for them because Satan's the puppet master and they're the puppets. So he's just using them to oppress a lot of people. And if you allow yourself to be oppressed, hey, whatever, it's your thing. Do what you want to do. But the point is when you want to live for God and God knows it, it's in your heart. It's in your fiber. It's in your being. He sees you pursuing holiness. He sees you comparing yourself, your heart, your attitudes to the word of God. He sees you trying to line up with him in every way, shape, and form, every way possible. He sees it. He sees when you fall flat on your face and how you agonize over it because see, here's the part that a lot of people, and you find it in the body of Christ, where there are a lot of people who really are lukewarm. They're not hot. They're not cold. What is what did Jesus say to the church of Laodicea? Because you're not hot, neither are you cold. I will spew you out of my mouth. You ever drink lukewarm? You, you, you know, you think you're going to drink a nice hot something and it's lukewarm. You almost want to spit it out as soon as it touches your tongue. Well, that's what he's saying he's going to do to lukewarm people. 
And he's talking to the church. Check that out. So what I want to share with you is if you are lukewarm, one of the ways you know it is when you commit that little dastardly sin over there or you hang out with so-and-so and, -so and y'all get caught up with a little something, something. And you know, ain't no question, you know. You know you have, you have slid back or stepped over to the wrong side of the tracks. You know it. But here's the part. Did it break your heart? Did you cry because you didn't want to go to hell? You didn't want that booty whooping? You didn't want God to expose you? Or did you cry and agonize because you don't want to let your God down? There's a difference. That's how you kind of know when you're really in the light and when you're not. See, when you make excuses for what you're doing, and, 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 and well, you know, I'm human. Yeah, you're human. Well, what does your heart do when, you, when that human being falls on their face? What does that heart do? Are you crying to God, Lord, don't let me lose out on you, Lord. I want to be close to you. I don't, I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to do things that break your heart. I don't want to uh, insult you to your face, Lord. Please help me line up with you. I don't like this. Deliver me. Deliver me, Lord. Are you really seeking him for deliverance? Or are you just, well, Lord, you know, I just ask you to, you know, forgive me, you know, because, boy, you know, I'm... I'm having a hard time in this body, boy. You know, Lord, you know, you'd be shocked where the fire is. Is there more fire coming out of you when you're committing that deed? Or is there more fire coming out of you when you're begging God to deliver you, cleanse you, purify you, forgive you? Where's the fire? Where's your fire? Ha! Huh? Yeah. Okay. So. I just said that to say, God knows who's who and what's what. Sometimes we don't. Okay, Romans 2. Now we'll go to Romans 2. Okay. And in Romans 2, it sounds like I'm off the beaten path, but you'll see it come together as I read on. Therefore thou art an inexcusable, O man, whoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest this, thinkest thou this, O man, thou that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God, O despisest thou not? The riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. I say it all the time and I, I got to repeat it because people don't get it. Repentance is not the apology. That's not the, when you say, well, what does it mean to repent? It's not, oh God, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. That's not the repentance. Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. That's not the repentance. The repentance is when you dig in with all fours and you grab a hold of him like the hem of his garment and you fight the crowd and you fight the circumstances and you fight yourself to live that holy life. You get a hold on him. God, God, I messed up. Lord, I don't want to live like this because it's agonizing to you to know that you're not pleasing to God. It's not a light thing. You don't take it lightly because you have the fear of God in your bosom. You know who he is and you ain't playing with him. There's a difference between the apology and the repentance, because the repentance fights tooth and nail to obey. And the apology, it's easy to just keep going back to that same problem over and over and over. I'm so glad God is merciful. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, I'm glad you're glad. Now, this is an example of people who abide in the darkness, leaning to their own understanding, living by their own standards, their own values. No fear of God. 
You know, you're just over the top. And they were looking at Stephen like he was definitely over the top. So when he's he's telling them, he's running down how people have treated God's people. I'm just jumping for the sake of time. This is their reaction. When they heard these things, verse 54, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. This got me. And saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now check it out. None of the other people saw that. Ain't that a trip? You know why? Because they're still in the dark. He's in the light, but they're in the dark. So he sees a whole lot more that's going on. And they miss out because their spirits are in the dark. Okay, listen to this. Listen to this. 56. And said, oh, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. That's what demons do too. They stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness, the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Mm, mm, mm. And they stoned Stephen, called, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knew he was out of here. And he knelt, he knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he, had laid, when he thus said, he fell asleep. Now, the thing I love about God is I honestly believe he didn't feel the pain. I do. I believe God numbed him. He knew he was on his way out. But I believe God numbed him from feeling that pain. I really believe that. See, when you walk in the light with God, there are a lot more benefits. There are things that could happen, but they don't happen. Why? Because you're all the way in him. You may not be living that perfect life, but your heart is perfect. You're in true repentance. You don't want to dabble in anything that would hurt his heart. So, I'll give you a quick example. Years ago, uh, my husband, my little big-headed husband, uh, woke me up out of a deep sleep. I had worked all day at the salon and then worked all night taking care of him. And I was exhausted. And he, he called me out of a deep sleep. I felt like I was being sucked through a tube. I was in such a deep sleep. And when I, I tried to get out because I was still in the fog and I didn't know I was on the edge of the bed. Check this out. Check this out. I fell, all this 200 and something pounds fell flat on my knee, my kneecap. I fell on it, baby. I didn't roll to the side. I fell on my knee. And I prayed, God, numb it. Immediately, as soon as I, as I, I felt the fall, I said, Lord, numb it, numb it, numb it. I, I can't. I don't have the time to go to the hospital. I don't have the time to get rehabilitation and all kind of physical therapy and all. I have to take care of my husband and I have to work. So I am asking you, Lord, let no weapon formed against me prosper on this one. In Jesus' name, I'm not going to move till I feel it get numb. Milton will just have to wait another minute, but I'm asking you to numb this knee. And this is what I'm asking you, because I'm living in the light now. I'm not living perfect, but I'm living in the light. My heart is perfect. My intentions are perfect. Lord, whatever you do, keep this booger numb until you've completely healed it. Would you believe that knee stayed numb? for two and a half years before any hint of feeling started coming in. And I get this little underlying sensation of itching, but just slightly, never any pain, never. Because God fulfilled that word. No weapon formed against you will prosper. And I was able to quote the word 
because the word is in the light. And I was able to get a hold of that bad boy and pull it into my body by faith, asking God to do it by faith. See, there are things you don't have to feel. There are things you don't have to experience. Hardships you don't have to go through. If you have an ear to hear what your father saying to your spirit. But are you listening? Are you asking? Or are you tiptoe through the tulips? With your eyes closed. Going in the wrong direction. Aiming straight for the darkness. What are you doing? All right, I'm not fussing. Not fussing, really I'm not. But you can avoid so much heartache. You can avoid, see, things happen to everybody. But here's the difference. God's the buffer. Didn't know that, did you? He's the painkiller. Hmm. He's the mind regulator. He's the heart mender. He's the deliverer. You don't have to be stuck in that for the rest of your life. You don't have to be living your life in the rearview mirror with all the mounds of hurts, bitterness, anger. No, you don't have to do that. So let's move into the light. Let's get in there as bright as it can be. Because as much as you give your body a living sacrifice, the more light you enter into. The more you obey, the more light you enter into. The more truthful you are with him, even when you don't want to do right, tell him the truth. The more light you're moving into. Be real with him, y'all. And let him have you 100%. Amen. And you will be a witness for him. You will be his servant. You will be an anointed one. Not somebody out there like a false prophet. Like we see all over the place. Slick Willie. Ha, okay. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Love y'all. I hope I wasn't too long. God bless you. I know I need to stop.